Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6, we dealt with the idea of uh, suffering and the response to suffering in Exodus chapter 5 and 6, uh, last Wednesday and then in Sunday school. And uh, uh, as we, he brings in uh, through most of the chapter 6 a genealogy of Aaron and Moses uh, through Simeon and Levi and uh, um, there. And then uh, he goes and, and as Moses is praying to the Lord, he uh, goes to, to the Lord and he says, uh, you know, how am I going to speak to Pharaoh? They're not, Pharaoh's not even listening to any of this. I'm uncircumcised. How's he going to listen to me? Uh, and in uh, Exodus chapter 7, uh, the Lord steps up and he begins to talk to, Fa- uh, to Moses and Aaron again and tells them to uh, pretty much uh, keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. And uh, chapter 7, verse 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. And thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people of the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded, so did they. And Moses was fourscore years old, and Aaron fourscore and three years old, when they spake unto uh, Pharaoh. And as the, the passage uh, begins to go down, Moses and Aaron step into Pharaoh's court yet once again, uh, telling uh, Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go. And um, uh, Pharaoh doesn't uh, uh, take it, he doesn't uh, allow it, and he says this, uh, uh, verse 8, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, verse 9, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you. Then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a servant. Uh, And so Moses and Aaron step into the the, the hall there, and uh, they begin to say, Let my people go, and Pharaoh refuses. Uh, And so Moses and Aaron, Aaron takes the rod that uh, Moses had there and throws it down, and uh, we know through the power of God that it becomes a a, a snake. It becomes a a serpent there. Uh, But in the midst of this, Pharaoh, looking on at this, Uh, uh, takes it and he calls up his magicians and uh, he says, hey, you know what? I want you to do what they're doing. And uh, as we know through the story that the magicians come up and uh, through sleight of hand, through black magic, through the power of Satan, whatever it is that they have there, uh, they are able to imitate uh, the, uh, the same uh, miracle that's going on. And uh, then after that, uh, the, what happens there is the, the serpent of, of Aaron or Moses' staff ends up eating all three of uh, the, or all of the magicians' uh, serpents that are there. Uh, but while at the same time, because of uh, the Pharaoh's magician's ability to uh, imitate what God is doing uh, through the the power uh, through Moses and Aaron there, uh, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And so they leave and then they come back the next day. uh, God tells uh, Moses, as you read through the rest of chapter 7, that you need to go out and as Pharaoh is going to the Nile River, Uh, You're going to meet him, and you're going to once again tell him, let my people go. And he says, if you don't, uh, then you are going to strike out your hand, and you are going to turn the Nile River into blood. And we know that that happens. Uh, Pharaoh refuses. Moses stretches out his hand there, and uh, the entire river and all the the water round about there uh, turns to blood. And lo and behold, the magicians are able to come out and counterfeit the exact same thing. Not the exact same thing, but they counterfeit it and able to turn the water into blood. 
And I want to deal with this in two uh, areas here. And that first, looking at uh, the, the place of signs and wonders and miracles in the life of the nation of Israel, and then look at it uh, as well and, and how Satan uses that. And we need to understand that the nation of Israel uh, began with signs. And uh, we're going to get to a verse in, in Mark chapter 16. Uh, in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, it says something along the lines of, And these signs shall follow them that believe. And then it says, uh, They will uh, drink no deadly, or they will be drink uh, something that's poisonous and it won't kill them. They'll be able to handle snakes and they'll be able to uh, talk talk in new tongues, and uh, they'll be able to heal, they'll be able to do, cast out demons, those sort of things. And uh, that has been taken and adopted uh, by different denominations uh, all throughout the United States uh, to talk about apostolic signs and to talk about the sign gifts. Uh, most notably is the, the sign of tongues. That's probably what's used or, or picked on, uh, used more than anything out of the signs. Um, but uh, uh, the idea of of handling snakes, uh, that's a fun thing if you get on YouTube, look up, uh, you know, snake handling churches, and uh, you can see in there, they're, they're the biggest bunch of fakers, because the Bible verse says they can take up serpents, and they're not going to get hurt, and you know what all of them do? They run around, they hold the snake by the tail with a big old long stick on this end, making sure the head doesn't get anywhere near their body. You know why? Because they're fakers. Amen. They're just some crazy backwoods people that just like snakes. Amen. Um, but, uh, so, but what that goes on, uh, and uh, the, the signs of healing uh, is used uh, to... to Make money at. Let's just call it what it is. Usually, make money. Uh, uh, Oral Roberts and uh, Ernest Ainsley and Kenneth Copeland and all these other guys. Uh, they think that uh, they don't think they they have to know that they're a faker. Amen. Anybody ever hear of uh, was it Marjo? What was name, last name started with a G? Gutman or Gervinus or some, something like that. Uh, he was a, a, a faith healer. Uh, started at four years old. His, their, his parents, because he was able to articulate well at four years old, uh, his parents put him up to being a preacher in faith healing. And because he had good stage presence and all that sort of stuff, he became famous and did a lot of money uh, for, uh, for his parents. As he got into about 17 years old, he, he grew just to, didn't want to deal with it anymore, uh, recognized that it was fake. And then about 19 years old, he realizes, I sure missed the money, and he goes back into it. It. And uh, for a couple of years, he goes back into it. And then towards the end of it, uh, he allowed a, a documentary to follow him, some documentary, whatever people that make documentary, documentaries, uh, to follow him for this last uh, tour or whatever it is. And they show him uh, uh, behind the scenes and talking and counting their money in the hotel room at the end of the, the charade. Uh, and you know what it is? It's just a charade. You know, let me ask you something. All these fake faith healers, you know, send me your money and I'll send you a little piece of cloth that we dipped in oil and, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, and they're always asking for money. Now you tell me, what faith healer that knew that they could heal somebody would not step foot into a child hospital? And if you were to do that, walk up and down. I mean, you might have to run for your life from the hospital. They might want to, uh, you know, go after you. Uh, but I, would, I bet if you could walk through that child ward and say, healed, 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 there'll be a whole bunch of parents who say, well, how much you want? You would not have to ask for money if you were a true faith healer. But you know what they do is they, 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 they beg and they cajole and they, they put on a great big show uh, and it's used and the verses that are used uh, talk about legitimate signs and wonders that are used by God. And so I want to look kind of just through the Bible about signs and wonders. What is it? Why are they there? What is it used for? But then also on the flip side of it, how it's counterfeited. And uh, so what we find out is Exodus chapter 4, Exodus chapter 7. All through the first about 15, 18 chapters of the book of Exodus, we find the nation of Israel begins with signs. Uh, they begin uh, with signs to confirm what God is saying, and uh, they uh, begin with signs, they continue with signs. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, uh, when uh, Samuel goes and he begins to uh, anoint Saul uh, to confirm that Saul was the one that was supposed to be the next king of Israel, uh, when he does that, uh, Samuel says, this is going to be a sign to you uh, that when you prophesy, and he lists out about two or three different things there, and what we find out is that Saul does that, and it confirms uh, what is going on. Uh, look at Isaiah chapter 38, verse 7. 
God uses through the Old Testament, and we would be here for, for days on end looking at all the times a miracle uh, or a sign happens uh, in the Bible. But God, first off, when you understand, what is the point of a sign? What is the point of a miracle? Be it healing, be it tongues, be it uh, uh, you know any of those things, drinking deadly poisons, all that. What is the point of a sign? Well, look at Isaiah chapter 38, uh, verse 7. It says this, And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Uh, this is about Hezekiah as he was uh, uh, very, very sick, was getting close to dying. Isaiah comes in and, and uh, uh, prophesies to him, talks to him, preaches to him. Uh, and uh, Hezekiah humbles himself and prays. And God grants him 15 more years um, before he's going to die. And uh, Hezekiah asks for a sign to confirm is this really what's going to happen and uh, this uh, as he says in verse 7 that the Lord is going to give a sign and in verse 8 is that to, uh, he brings the the sundial backwards 10 degrees uh, to prove or to confirm that what God was saying uh, was true that perform to to confirm that what the prophet was saying uh, was true go with me if you would to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, we find out when Jesus Christ comes on the scene uh, that over and over again, the people, the Pharisees, the scribes, all of them, the nation of Israel, continually ask Jesus Christ for a sign. John chapter 2, verse 18. It says this, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Things. He had been preaching and he had gone into the temple and he had, in the previous verses, 13 down to 17, he had gone in the temple, made a whip and had driven them out. Uh, one of the, the couple times that he did that in the, in the Gospels here and uh, he steps up and he throws them all out of there, says, don't make my father's house a house of merchandise. Uh, and then the Jews step up and pretty much saying, uh, show us a sign to prove that you have the authority to do what you just did. And Jesus Christ responds to them to destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. Uh, they obviously are thinking physical, but he's talking about his body, the resurrection. Um, but they're constantly asking for a sign. Uh, Mark chapter 8, Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 16, over and over and over again, uh, they come to Jesus and they say, ask us for a sign, which is crazy to me because what is he doing all of the time? He's healing, and he's casting out demons, and he's raising the dead. He's uh, all sorts of stuff uh, Jesus Christ is doing, but they're going after a sign uh, to, to seek uh, the what, uh, because that's what the Jews do. Just to be honest with you, that's what the Jews do. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. It's not only Jesus Christ that does it, but he takes his 12 uh, apostles, his 12 disciples there, and he gives them the power uh, of some of these signs. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, says this, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Uh, and then uh, he tells them down in verse 8, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. And so we find out is that the nation of Israel started with signs, they continually ask for a sign, and God uses miracles and signs and wonders to confirm the direction that God wants the nation of Israel to go to, to confirm the word that is being preached. While Jesus Christ is here, he provides his 12 uh, apostles, 12 disciples there, uh, including Judas, which is interesting. He says 12, and that will include Judas Iscariot, uh, with this power, with this ability to do these signs and wonders. Um, and in Luke chapter 10, he also gives the 70 disciples uh, at least a, a limited form of this as well. Um, but what's going on here? Now go to the would do Matthew or excuse me, Mark chapter sixteen. Mark chapter sixteen. As Jesus Christ is uh, has already risen from the dead, uh, he has uh, come out. He spent the the forty days or so there uh, after he is, he's risen from the dead, and he's getting ready to leave. Uh, and after the uh, right before that, he says in verse Matthew or Mark chapter sixteen verse fourteen, it says afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, 
and upbraided them with their uh, upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was rig- risen. And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And then the Lord is taken up into heaven uh, in his ascension. And so the question is begged, uh, why, we have to have one or two questions. Either signs and miracles are for us today, uh, and if so, uh, who's the one that's doing them? Or we have to recognize that uh, the position that I take, which I believe the Bible supports, is that signs and miracles, signs and wonders, uh, healing, uh, tongues, all those sort of things, um, are directed toward the Jewish nation. We need to understand that. As we look through the book of Acts, uh, we're not going to go through it, but I'm just going to give you a quick synopsis here. Uh, in the book of Acts, uh, you're going to find a number of times where tongues come out, where healing comes out, where uh, different things uh, come out uh, in, the, in the, the, the spot there. And what you're going to find is that most of the time, I'm going to say... 87.5% of the time, I don't know the exact amount, but it sounded good, 87.5% uh, of the time, there is an unbelieving Jew that's present where the sign of the miracle is being at. Uh, Acts chapter 2, one of the most famous uh, passages in terms of tongues and everything that's going on, and you know who uh, Peter is preaching at? Ye men of Israel. Ye men of Israel, uh, brothers uh, uh, of Israel, he's preaching to the nation of Israel. In Acts chapter 3, uh, when there's a healing of the man by Peter and John, uh, they're in the temple. In Acts chapter 5, where there's signs and wonders, there's in the temple. Uh, in Acts chapter uh, uh, 9, with the healing of Tabitha and Joppa, and in Joppa all there, uh, is in the nation of Israel. Uh, in Acts chapter 10 is one of the few times where there is a sign or a wonder, a miracle, uh, specifically tongues in this uh, fashion, where there's not a believing Jew present, or excuse me, an unbelieving Jew present or a Jew present. Acts chapter 10 deals with Cornelius. And Peter, uh, God gives him the vision of the great sheet coming down and that you can eat anything and that God is putting away the ceremonial aspects of the law and that there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile in the church. And so God sends Peter to go preach to the Gentiles, uh, to Cornelius. And uh, as P Peter begins to preach, then the uh, Holy Ghost falls on them. They speak in, in tongues. And you wonder, well, what is that? Well, what you find out is that in Acts chapter 11, a bunch of people come to to Peter and they say, what are you doing at the Gentiles? And you know what Peter says? I was preaching to him. God gave me the vision. I went to this. I preached, the, preached about Jesus Christ to him and the Holy Ghost fell and tongues came down. And the church begins to realize because of the confirmation of God with signs and wonders and miracles that God is moving in a particular direction. Uh, in uh, Acts chapter 13, uh, Paul is able, uh, in, in uh, the last, really the last main time that you see signs and wonders and miracles happening is in Acts chapter 14, and again dealing with unbelieving Jews. And uh, anybody know what happens in Acts chapter 13? It's Paul's first missionary journey. And you know what you find through the rest of the book of Acts? Outside of Acts chapter 14, uh, where there's some unbelieving Jews present, uh, you don't find any more miracles with the exception of Paul getting his hand bit off. Now, God gets him out of prison. I understand that. God you know, brings uh, uh, Paul and Silas out of the jail cell in Acts chapter 16. But as far as signs and wonders and miracles, uh, the only thing that happens is Acts chapter 28 where the serpent bites Peter, or Paul and it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't kill him. It doesn't hurt him. Uh, other than that, uh, the signs and the wonders begin to fade out uh, from use in the book of Acts. Why? Because in the book of Acts, God is robbing Peter to pay Paul. He's taking going from Israel to the church. He's going from Jerusalem to Antioch. He's moving away from the Jews because of their rejection throughout uh, the book of Acts. And the only time that you find uh, signs or wonders or tongues or those sort of things mentioned in Pauline epistles is Romans and, and uh, Corinthians. And both of those are very early books that are written uh, as far as, I think, Corinthians was 59, and I think Romans was right about there, somewhere between 56 and 62. Uh, very early uh, in Paul's ministry does he write the book of Romans, 
Romans and then Corinthians uh, there. And uh, those are the only areas that you find tongues uh, and uh, signs and wonders being used. Why? Go with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. And in the book of Acts, it moves from uh, uh, signs and wonders, uh, then it moves into the preaching of the gospel uh, by Paul uh, and uh, to the Gentiles. Why? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, it says this, For the Jews require a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. God is laying out a, 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 a piece of information here that is being backed up by all the rest of the Old Testament is that the Jews, in order to operate, they are hardwired, programmed uh, to ask for a sign and require a sign, and God gives them that as uh, they begin to, as, the, as he confirms his word. Uh, what you find out uh, is as Paul's ministry begins to, to go, uh, he even uh, loses his, uh, a lot of sense of uh, his is able to work miracles. Uh, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter uh, 4, uh, verse 20, uh, the Bible says that uh, uh, the Bible says uh, Paul left uh, Trophimus, not Trophimus, 2 Timothy chapter 5. He left a guy who was sick because he wasn't able to heal him. 2 Timothy chapter 5, verse 10. I think it was Trophimus. Uh, let's see here. Uh, first Timothy, not second Timothy. Where's his name at? It's in there, I promise. I believe it was Trophimus. I'll find the right verse. I don't know why it's. Um, it says, uh, I left him sick. Does anybody have it? What is it? Tyke, no. No, that's 12. Profitable to me is a ministry. The cloak I left. Copper must do me much evil. There it is, verse 20, 2 Timothy 4.20. It says this, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Well, we know 2 Timothy is written later uh, in Paul's uh, uh, ministry, about 66 A.D., somewhere in there, late 60s A.D., and Paul's ability to do signs and wonders has gone away. Uh, I mean, how <laughs> he must have really not liked the guy if he could heal him, but he says, you're out of here, I'm leaving you sick. Uh, why? He wasn't able to do it uh, because those things were moved away because Paul was going to the Gentiles primarily at the end uh, of his ministry. Uh, and in fact, as Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, he, tells, uh, uh, first, uh, he tells Timothy uh, a verse that every drunk knows, uh, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Well, why didn't Paul just heal him of whatever gastrointestinal diseases he had going on? Because he didn't have the ability, because those signs and wonders and miracles were primarily for the Jewish nation. Uh, go to one other place here, Hebrews chapter 2, uh, on this idea, is that God uses these signs and miracles to confirm his word. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 3 and 4. It says this, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and miracles and gifts of the court of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Uh, he's saying here that the, the salvation, the things that were preached uh, were confirmed by God by the signs and the miracles witnessed uh, that, was, uh, that God had laid out. And so when we talk about signs and wonders and miracles, uh, we normally refer to them as apostolic signs because those were given to those first apostles uh, to uh, be able to, to manifest God's will to the nation of Israel. And as each time, Acts chapter 7, I believe it's 
since Acts chapter 18 and Acts chapter 28, as the, as the Jews reject the message about Jesus Christ, as they reject the message of Israel coming back to God, those things all begin to go down and uh, down even further. And so now, but we also have uh, in our day and age, uh, many, actually many groups of different uh, denominations of Christians that will use most prominently the gift of tongues to uh, really, they'll, they'll say that if, you're, if you haven't spoken in tongues and you haven't received the Holy Ghost, so therefore uh, you're not saved. Uh, go with me if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. A lot of times if you talk to somebody about the use of tongues, uh, you're not going to be able to... Uh, you know, run them through all these verses and show them through the book of Acts and do all these different things. Um, so what I, how I deal with people about this idea of signs and wonders and miracles and tongues uh, is that, you know what, I'll grant it to him. I said, okay, if, if you want to say that, that tongues are for us, absolutely, let's talk about that. Uh, does the Bible show us what should be done, done with tongues? And the modern charismatic tongues movement will not know the one chapter in the Bible that lists out tongues. All right, and that's First Corinthians chapter fourteen, uh, verse tw- uh, down from about oh, verse twenty-two uh, down through the end of the chapter. Here is he gives out the guidelines for the gift of tongues. Look at First Corinthians fourteen twenty-two. It says this: Wherefore tongues are for a sign. And if you have uh, margins in your Bible there, uh, take a pen and write 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 that says, Wherefore the Jews require a sign, not the Greeks. It says, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So why is it, first off, if tongues are for us, why are tongues being used primarily to, quote-unquote, believers in a church? Well, already strike one. They're not being used how uh, they say it. Um, but uh, so here's what, it, here's what it says here. Uh, verse 27, it says this. This is how tongues, if we were to start a tongue service next Sunday, we're say this, we're going to have a tongue speaking service and we're going to do it according to the Bible. This is how it should be laid out. Uh, verse 27, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, Notice it doesn't say uh, uh, other tongue. It doesn't say uh, a heavenly language. It just says unknown. Okay. Uh, And what you'll also find is that every time tongues are used in the Bible, it's never gibberish. It's always somebody speaking and somebody hearing them in their own language. That's, that's the idea of tongues. But anyway, verse 27, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at most by three. So if we're going to have a tongue speaking service, uh, only two or at most three people would be able to participate. All right, that's the first thing. And that by course. What does that mean? That means you've got to take turns. Okay? And then he says this, And let one interpret. It says, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So what God is saying is that if you're going to have tongues, uh, which I believe are not for us, but okay, if we're going to do it, then only two or three people at one time can do it. Uh, They have to take turns and there must be an interpreter to give the message to edify the church. Now, let me ask you, where has that ever been done? Never. Never. Uh, never. Uh, it's just absolutely crazy. And then the one that really gets them is verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted for them to speak. What is that for? That's for tongues. God lays out the stipulation for tongues uh, is that uh, a woman is not supposed to do it. And so when you meet the guy that says his, you know, great, great grandmommy uh, that uh, is just such a godly woman, you know, and she spoke in tongues and she did this. I'm going to have to say it wasn't from God because the stipulations lay out that it's two or three at most with an interpreter and women aren't supposed to do it. And then it says this in the spirit, verse 32 says this in the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Meaning God does not come in and override your physical and mental faculties uh, and cause you to be slain in the spirit and got to have some guy running with a blanket to throw over the immodest lady. You would think that if God is taking over your body, he would help the woman be modest. 
God's going to take over my body, but yet he's going to make me, you know, flash somebody or whatever it may be. You're not thinking, not thinking at all. And so you got to have a blanket, you know, run over and throw her on the ground. You think, well, you're making fun. I'm pointing out the fact uh, that this is how the Bible says to do it if we're going to go down that route. And not a single one uh, of, of anybody that uses tongues and those sort of things will follow what the Word of God says. And then what he also says, uh, look at verse 39 of the same chapter. It says this, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. In other places, he says, you know what? Covet the best gifts. And then he lists out a whole bunch of gifts that are uh, available there. And the last one on the list is tongues, uh, not the first. But these signs and wonders and miracles uh, uh, are used by God. They are legitimate, but they're for the nation of Israel to confirm his word, God's word, to go in a certain direction. But... Go with me. I want to let you look at three verses, and then we'll be done. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. As we read in Exodus chapter 7, uh, God's not the only one with people that can do miracles. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. He says this, For uh, such are false uh, apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You know what he's saying? He's saying when the devil shows up to deceive people, he's not going to come with a red suit and a pitchfork. He's going to come with a really nice expensive suit, and a slick back hairdo, and a really smooth, uh, uh, a calming voice uh, that's going to spew out uh, lies, and people will lap it up. That's what the devil's going to come at. Look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Signs, wonders, and miracles will be counterfeited and are counterfeited by the devil. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Let's start at verse uh, 6. 2 Thessalonians 2, 6. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and, with the, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders." You know, when the devil shows up on this scene, when the church is taken out of here, when the Antichrist comes in, uh, uh, you, know what, uh, you know what he's going to come in with? He's going to come in with signs and wonders. Why? Because he's, he's going to want to take that nation of Israel, that Jew, and sign a piece of... You think about this, all, the, you know, all these people talking about the Antichrist and you know, yada, 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 uh, who it's going to be. Uh, you, have, have, um, you read about the Jewish people. They're not dumb. I mean, normally, regularly, uh, most of the time, in the highest people in different areas are Jewish people. The banking industry is run by Jews. The Hollywood is run by Jews. They're not dumb people. And so if the devil comes in uh, supporting the, the Muslims and the Catholic Church and all this sort of stuff and then says, hey, you know what, Jews, we need to sit down and talk. You know what the Jews are going to do? Yeah, right. But when he comes in and says, uh, I've got a miracle to show you. And he begins to speak in tongues. He begins to do uh, powers. He begins to raise things from the dead. Look at Revelation chapter 13. And that's what he ends up doing, is using signs and wonders and lying wonders to deceive the world and to deceive the Jews uh, into accepting him. Uh, you know what is going to come in? Uh, God, Jesus tells them in Matthew chapter 24 that, there, that there will, so people will say, Lo, there is Christ. Christ is here. Christ is here. And he says, don't follow after them. 
When, when the Antichrist comes in, when the devil comes in and he gets his show on the road, he is going to show up uh, looking and, and portraying himself to be Jesus Christ with the signs and wonders to go with it. That's what the devil is going to show up as. Revelation chapter 13, verse 13, it says this. <clears throat> it says, And he doeth... All right, let's, let's uh, start verse 11 just to get the context. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. And, excuse me, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Does this sound familiar? There's one guy that comes first and he dies and somebody else that raises his from the dead. Look at verse 13. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by the sword and did live and had power to to give life unto the image of the beast. Everybody's, oh, well, that's holograms and that's TV. No, that, no, 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 no. He's got a power that can take an image and make it real. That's the devil. It says that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. When the devil comes in, he is smooth, he is sly, and he counterfeits everything Jesus does. And we have to be aware of that. Uh, and uh, the, one of the, the strongest and most powerful things that Satan can do is take something that's good, something that God laid out, pull it out of where it's supposed to be, plug it into where it's not supposed to be, and now he's got 90% truth with about 10% lie. Anybody remember, uh, know how much uh, of rat poison is actually poison? 0.05% normally. Normally it's 99.95% other ingredients and then 0.05% whatever it is they, they use to kill rats. And it's just that little bit of twisting that can make something wrong. And that's what the devil's going to do. And we see that in the book of Exodus. At the start of the nation of Israel, God is showing signs and wonders. And uh, actually, many of these signs and wonders and miracles are going to come back uh, in the, in the, during the tribulation time period with when God takes 144,000 Jews and he seals them on their forehead. Uh, they're going to be able... Does it, and remember what happens in the book of Revelation that God sends down wormwood and it uh, uh, makes all the waters bitter and people can't drink the water but yet God has a group of his people that are able to go out and spread out the entire world and preach and they can drink something that is deadly and it's not going to kill them. What is it? It's all coming back around. And as the nation of Israel started with signs and wonders and as, as the devil uh, tried to, uh, uh, did counterfeit some of those uh, uh, miracles, we find out that after uh, the water, after the, the snakes, the water, uh, the frogs, uh, then uh, they are able to uh, counterfeit all of those. But then God shows his power when he takes dust, the original act of creation, and brings out life, brings out lice uh, from that dust. And the magicians say, we got nothing. But Satan counterfeits all those sort of things. And as it was at the beginning of the nation of Israel, so it is going to be at the beginning uh, of, of the rebirth of the nation of Israel in the tribulation. And you know what it is? Our job is not to look for signs, wonders, and miracles. As the book of Acts begins to develop, uh, as uh, those signs and wonders begin to go away, uh, I believe those signs and wonders go away. I believe it's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, those signs and wonders go away because the written word of God is being completed. And as Paul begins to write, and he writes all of those books, and the, the New Testament canon begins to come together with the, the Apostle John dying off, uh, he, uh, the, the written word of God is completed, and we don't need signs, wonders, and miracles. You know how we test? In, in, uh, in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 2, John writes, I'll end right here, John writes to the, the, uh, the, the church at Ephesus. And he commends the church of Ephesus. Why? Because the Bible says that there were those that called themselves apostles. And the Bible says the church of Ephesus tried them and found them that they were to be liars. How did they do that? What had been written? 
what had been preached to them, the truth that had been laid out. Uh, and uh, that's, what, that's our job. That's our job is to look at something, compare it to the Word of God, and even though it may be just minusculely off, twisted just a little bit, it's enough that it's wrong. And so when we think about signs and wonders and miracles, we need to be thinking about the fact that God is dealing with the nation of Israel. All right, uh, so that's the lesson for tonight. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the, the lesson, the Bible, how you've laid everything out just perfectly, God, uh, and how you do things. And I pray that you would just give us a wisdom about this, God. I pray that you'd give us a, a desire to study your word and to find out where all these pieces fit. Um, I pray that you'd just be our guide and interpreter to always keep the truth of scriptures uh, where it's supposed to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Anybody have any questions about that? I know I threw a lot at you, but... You mentioned about the, you know, the word says unknown tongues, and mm-hmm. it's in italics, mm-hmm. and that's not supposed to be in the original, you know, mm-hmm. and they kind of added that for clarity, but they use that for, um, to say it's an unknown tongue, like as if it's not a literal language, and that's where they get up with that, with that gibberish. Right. And what you find out is that every time somebody speaks in tongues, if you read through the book of Acts, is that it's unknown to the person that's speaking it. But yet in the book of Acts, if you read Acts chapter 2, uh, the people look around and say, all of these guys that are talking are Galileans, but yet Arabians and all these sort of people are hearing it in their own language. And that's what's uh, going on there with the gift of tongues. Yep. Most of the time in those churches, too, it's almost always women. It's always women. Almost always women. Yeah. But, but grandma was just so godly, you know. But Bible, the Bible, the Bible. But it, it, when, you, when you let something get off just a little bit, and then over the course of time, it can, it can grow. And the most important thing is to be lined up with this book. So, all right. Well, thank you very much. Have a good evening. We're dismissed.